Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's and this year's Lise Meitner Award Ceremony. My name is Andreas Heinz. I'm actually the chair of the Lise Meitner Committee, which consists of also Dinko Shakarov, uh, Hans Nordmann, Anne-Marie Pendril, and uh, Vitali Shumeko. Um, it is my great pleasure to see all of you here. It is my great pleasure to see the room almost fully filled, so I'm very happy about this, and I'm fairly certain that you didn't came for nothing. Uh, we have a very well-deserving award here this year. So, <clears throat> maybe you let me start by saying a few words why we're actually here. And we are here because we have a Lisa Meitner Prize. That prize is named for a woman which actually did one of the groundbreaking discoveries of the 20th century, very close uh, to Gothenburg in Kumelf. But uh, Lisa Meitner is actually an exceptional personality from many points of view, and she is actually uh, one of our personal heroines for, I think, three reasons. Uh, the first one is uh, she did have exactly what uh, she said here, Life need not be easy, provided only that it is not empty. And in her case, this is certainly true. Her life certainly was not easy. She was, I believe, the first female professor in uh, Germany uh, in physics. Maybe even in total, I'm not quite sure about that. So she faced many obstacles, also being a foreigner coming from Austria. Uh, she faced even more obstacles, even just getting into science in the sense that uh, it was not easy to find a lab space for her. Uh, um, professors did not want to have a woman working in a chemistry environment because they had maybe a fire hazard and all kinds of things <laughs> were actually put forward as reasons uh, not to have women in science. She overcame all those optic obstacles due to a very uh, strong dedication to science and physics. And she became one of the very big names in science uh, in uh, the 20th century. I think uh, this is mostly <coughs> becomes clear when one uh, hears Einstein's quote, who called her our Marie Curie. Uh, her obstacles didn't stop there, uh, unfortunately. Even after a very distinguished career, she had to emigrate from Germany because of her uh, Jewish uh, origin um, in 1938, uh, rather late actually, she was protected by Austri being an Austrian citizen for a long time from uh, being prosecuted by the Nazis that stopped uh, as soon as Austria became actually united with Germany so that uh, <coughs> forced her to flee in really a big hurry, she took essentially nothing uh, from the place where she had spent uh, a very long time, I'm not sure, I think about 20 years or so at, at that point. So this was really not easy and she, start, she started when she came to Sweden as a refugee essentially from scratch. Uh, those were very difficult conditions. Nevertheless, she never stopped in being a great scientist. Uh, and this is actually the second reason why she's a personal heroine of mine. Uh, she worked on fission, which I did also during most of my career, and uh, fission is a very complex uh, process, and she was, of course, one of the big names who actually started literally the field, which is what very few people actually can say about themselves, that they started an entire field. Uh, the third reason why I'm actually very fond of Lisa Meitner is the fact that uh, people nowadays see this as a clear-cut case, which is always the case when you look at things in hindsight. You bombard a nucleus which is heavy enough with a neutron and it will split apart. Uh, this is not a given thing. Nuclei are actually very complex things. You have hundreds of nucleons and it's far from obvious by bombarding that you do not drill a hole uh, or just, you know, create some kind of motions, or just as we actually know, there's Bohr's compound nucleus hypothesis, that a nucleus can, uh, can evaporate neutrons and thereby getting rid of excitation energy. Uh, so 
taking the results which uh, were obtained uh, by the former members of the group in Berlin, uh, taking those results and actually interpreting those in a rather radically different way is something which is actually daring. She dared to go somewhere where people have not dared to go before. This is actually, from my point of view, what makes great science. Uh, you take results, you take the data, you take them seriously, and you go where this leads you, irrespective of what current opinion says. And uh, only if you actually have the courage to do that, you can actually make groundbreaking discoveries like Lisa Meitner did. Um, in order to commemorate this, uh, the Lisa Meitner House, uh, which is uh, on this photo here, became actually uh, last year, on October 29th, an EPS, uh, a European Physical Society historical site, and this plaque kind of uh, tells people why this is actually an important building. This is where she and her nephew, Otto Fritsch, stayed uh, during Christmas break in 1930. 1939, and uh, they discussed the findings uh, which uh, came from Berlin by letter, and uh, in discussions they came to the conclusion that what they actually observed was that heavy nuclei can split into two parts. So with that uh, little introduction, I would like to introduce the, uh, this year's awardee. Uh, standing next to me is François Comte. Uh, François Comte uh, is a well-known, world-accomplished astronomer. She works, uh, as far as I understand, mostly on the dynamics of uh, galaxies and galaxy formation. Uh, she did most of her career, as far as I know, uh, in Paris at uh, several universities. Uh, she works at Lerma, at the Paris Observatory. She has strong ties to Alma, to the Square Kilometer Array. She has been doing measurements at Onsala, so there's actually a strong connection uh, to Gothenburg. And uh, I listed only some of the prizes she uh, received so far. She, uh, she is a very well-known uh, scientist in her field. Now, in order to actually do the award ceremony, uh, we have Mats Wieber, the uh, uh, Pro Dean for Science at Chalmers University, and he does the honors. Okay. okay. It gives me great pleasure to, to offer you this plaque, the sign for the award. Thank you very much. Congratulations. <laughs> There is more. Mm -hmm. This one uh, also. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to you. Thank you very much. So, thank you. I will put my microphone. <laughs> Sorry. So, in order to deserve the prize, I'm afraid you have to work a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, we will now hear a lecture from you. I just can disconnect here. And we have to wait for a second, I believe. Well, in, during this uh, lapse time, I want yes. to thank you very much. I'm very honored about this uh, award. I thank uh, all the committee who has selected me, and I'm very impressed also here touch. And especially because of Liz Minor, I'm impressed by the, her personality and he's a remarkable uh, research woman who has very difficult conditions as you uh, emphasize she was very uh, alone a woman alone in the laboratory of men so she has to have very strong very courageous and perseverant and she had all these qualities and also a vision to see uh, the nature of the fission before the others so I think she was very, very, uh, it's a model for us, so I hope to follow her. And I'm very impressed by her and very happy that this uh, award is in memory of her. So thank you very much. <laughs> so for this lecture, I will uh, speak about uh, supermassive black holes. 
and the supermassive black holes were too greedy. That I mean by that, that they swallow all the gas around them, and when they have too much, they reject the gas, and as we describe it. So first, to introduce the topic, what is a black hole? For the, those who are not astrophysicists in the, in the audience, uh, a black hole is a point, as you can see, if I can uh, have, uh, yes. Uh, a point that I can uh, uh, draw like this, but in fact, as you know uh, from the general relativity theory of Einstein, the gravity force is not a normal force, it's like a deformation of space. So you are used to have this uh, little carpet at two dimensions. Well, it's difficult to see a three dimension, but uh, where maybe like a star is deforming the space and making a hole and then all the rest, uh, photons and so on, are deflected. When there is a black hole, there is a singularity. So you make a hole in the carpet here. You see the hole in the carpet. It's not possible to, to uh, describe it very much. Uh, inside the singularity is certainly not real, but there is no theory of quantum gravity for the moment. So we have to, uh, to stay outside. And outside, why? Because you have a radius that we call event horizon. It is a radius uh, where the escape velocity from the black hole is larger than the uh, velocity of light. So when you write this escape velocity here, let, let's say the kinetic energy V square is of the same order of the potential energy M over R. So you see that if you equate the escape velocity to C, you have this radius, the, uh, what we call horizon, which is uh, proportional to M. So let's uh, remember that it's proportional to M. And to give you order of magnitude, uh, for the sun, uh, one solar mass of star here, you have a radius of the horizon of three kilometer. And I give you the size of the sun now is 700,000 kilometer radius. So there is no, no danger that it is a black hole, fortunately. <laughs> so uh, also, uh, uh, there are only two quantities that define a black hole which is the mass, of course, and the spin. Of course, the spin is very frequent because, in general, you form supermassive black hole by merging of two spirals. The two spirals are rotating, and then you have a spin. All the black holes that we have been measuring have a spin. They could have a charge. I've not mentioned that, but the charge is generally uh, insignificant because uh, there is proton and electrons around, and it's cancelled out. So mass and spin, and it's only two quantities. So we usually say that the black hole has no hair, so nothing to remember the face of the black hole. <laughs> so uh, there's two kinds of black holes. Uh, one is uh, when uh, very massive stars die, there is an explosion of supernovae, and then if the core is massive enough, it collapses. In, uh, when it is 3 to 40 solar mass of, of black hole here. And of course, uh, there must be billions of uh, black holes in our Milky Way, in our galaxy, because there is 300 billions of stars, and all the massive stars that are already dead, they certainly form uh, black holes, but we cannot see them except when they are in binaries and they are uh, actively uh, accreting mass from their companion and they have become X-ray binary, uh, high mass X-ray binary. So uh, actually we know about 60 uh, solar mass black hole in the Milky Way. But so it's far from billions that are certainly existing. So uh, you see here when the, uh, the companion has a big envelope and gives mass to the black hole, it accretes and of course what you see is a light from the accretion disk. But I will not talk about a lot about this. I will talk about the supermassive black holes, which are between 1 million and uh, billions, uh, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 9. And uh, to give this relation again, uh, if you know that the uh, event horizon is proportional to the mass, now it's uh, light hours. And there is a very interesting thing, is that if you uh, compute the average density of the black hole divided by the volume of this horizon cube, then a uh, massive black hole is very diffuse, while a stellar mass black hole is very dense. And this has consequences because when the, you have tidal forces, the tidal forces are in one over r cube, as you know, and when uh, you approach a mass uh, to the black hole, it is distorted or disrupted by tidal forces when the density, the average density it feels, equals its own density. And uh, for a black hole of solar mass, if you put an astronaut around, it will be disrupted before entering the horizon, so you will see all the debris. Horrible. <laughs> but if an astronaut arrives to a supermassive black hole, it can cross the horizon without noticing it. 
it will be destroyed on the inside. It's not only valid for an astronaut, but for a star, for instance. So uh, a very massive black hole can swallow stars that we, without you noticing it. So it's very important also for the way that we see black hole. Now I have uh, uh, designed the black hole like a Mexican hat. Let you see why. <laughs> In fact, you don't see black holes. They are black. But what you see is the accretion disk around when there is matter falling in outside the horizon. And the property of the black hole is to deflect light. So you don't see, if you had a normal star, the accretion disk, when it is adjoined, you will see a line like this, the line here. But here you have uh, uh, lights coming here from the plate or the observer and uh, light coming from this side of the disk, this side, of the, and also below. So below you can also be deflected to the observer. So finally, what you see below is in gray here, and what you see above is here. So here it's come from the below, the accretion disk, and that's why it has this uh, Mexican hat. Also, the matter rotating around has a large velocity, relativistic velocity. Here you have red shifted and here blue shifted. And what is going towards you is Doppler boosted, so you see more like this, more the blue shifted side here. So this could be the way you can see the black hole. And uh, very, uh, in a ver very soon, I guess, you will see this kind of uh, uh, shadow of the black hole with the disk around. When with gravity, there is a, an instrument gravity put in the VLT interferometer that is able to have micro arc second and see the black hole of our own Milky Way. So we will see something. Well, I've not uh, make a, uh, I should make this uh, thing that uh, you are wondering why there are not masses in between. <laughs> so this is intermediate mass black holes. And there has been uh, recently a buzz that we have detected uh, an intermediate mass black hole in the, in the Milky Way. Well, I don't know if it is sure. It's a candidate, and maybe it's not sure, so I will not be very cautious, because there has many uh, candidates have been claimed in literature, and they are not, not right. Well, uh, about representation of black hole, there is one very good by Alain Riazuelo, who has made a movie about it. Uh, he made, uh, <coughs> he supposed that there is a stellar mass black hole very nearby the Earth, which is not very uh, probable, of course, but here you see a, a landscape, which is the Milky Way, and the Magellanic clouds, large Magellanic clouds and small Magellanic clouds, without black hole. And with black hole, you see that the Magellanic clouds is deformed by the optical lens. In fact, it's, uh, it's like a lens. It deflects the, the, the light. So you have the Magellanic clouds like this, and this star has been de-doubled in two images. So you see, uh, I can uh, encourage you to see the movie of Alain, which uh, the black hole is moving, and you see a lot of uh, strange effects. Well, the black hole, the supermassive black hole that we know the best, is though the one that is in our Milky Way, in the center. The Milky Way, uh, it's the galaxy we are in, so we see only the uh, adjoint view, this view, for instance. And of course, the, uh, what I show here is an artist's view of above, which you don't see. Of course, by analogy to other galaxies, we know that there is a bar, there are spiral arms. The sun is here, and the black hole is in the center. To give you scales, uh, here is 100,000 light years in diameter for the optical uh, Milky Way. So we are going to approach the center, to make a zoom to the center first, uh, in which light can we do that? We cannot do that in the optical light because what you see here is that there is a lot of dust. In fact, you see only the, the arm local to the sun and nothing. It's very dirty, uh, really. <laughs> you cannot uh, clean it with a vacuum cleaner. So what you do is you change your wavelength. Your wavelength here is optical. You, you, you go to near infrared. And why? Because the size of the dust is 0.5 microns. So it's uh, the same as the size of the optical light. And if you go to two microns, well, it's less uh, arrested by, obscured by the... So you can see in the two micron uh, this view of the Milky Way as if you were uh, outside, the disk and the bulge. Uh, the bulge is a peanut shape. I don't know if you see very well, but it means that there is a bar, and but there is a very small bulge. Uh, so as you see, there is a very small black hole. It's only four million solar mass, but uh, it's still interesting. So you see now the zoom. Uh, we had 100,000 light years. Now you have one light year. You have to make a, a big step. 
And what you see is stars, though in near infrared stars, uh, uh, nuclear stellar cluster. And uh, another the zoom here is to go to one light year to 20 light days this time. And you see stars one by one. And here you see the difference is that we use adaptive optics. Because here you have the um, turbulence of the atmosphere, which is blurring images. And here you have only the uh, ring of the diffraction uh, uh, deformation of each star. So it's a point source. And for adaptive optics, I can show you a little animation showing you how you pass from a blurred image to uh, when the adaptive optics is on at the VLT. You can have exactly the size of the diffraction limit of each point source. So you see a very large improvement, and that's why you can see uh, stars one by one. And when you have made that, then you have a beautiful movie here. Uh, there are two groups doing that. In fact, one in uh, Munich, uh, Genzel groups, and uh, also with the help of some uh, French people in Observatory of Paris, and also a group in California uh, with a CAC. So the European group is with VLT. And what you see here is a monitoring from 20 years. In fact, you begin in 1995, so about 20 years. And uh, each star is really the proper motion that you see during 20 years. And you see that uh, uh, they are obeying some Kepler, perfect Kepler orbits, because you are very inside the bulge. And what is dominating here is only one mass, the black hole. So they are in the sphere of influence of the black hole. It's uh, only a few per sec. And uh, a point mass gives you Kepler orbit. So you are, the black hole is at the focus of the ellipse. And uh, the velocities of the stars are 1,000 or 2,000 kilometers per second. So it's big, respect to the sun, which is rotating by 200 kilometers per second. So 10 times more in velocities. So you see, there's a lot of information here. Uh, you you uh, wonder why we know that the black hole is here, because it, there's no activity. But then when you look at this <coughs> animation, then you know why. Because what you see here is the same thing, but all these stars are still flickering a bit, but it is the atmosphere, the turbulence. Even with adaptive optics, it's not perfectly corrected. But what you see here in the center is a, a flare, a flare in the infrared. There is a flare also in X-ray, in radio, and so on. Uh, usually we know already that uh, Sagittarius A star is uh, a terminology for a radio source, so there is a radio source here. And there is also a variability. At, uh, it is accelerated here, but the period or quasi-period is a quarter of an hour. Quarter of an hour. Already you know that the object may be very compact. And why? In fact, it's a, a fact that we use very frequently in astronomy is when you have uh, something variable with a certain amount of time, then you deduce the size. Because if the object was bigger than the size uh, corresponding, for instance, to the quarter light time, then all the variability would be canceled out. Because uh, the light makes a certain amount of time to go from the one part of the object to the other. So they would not be in phase. The burst would not be in phase, and you would see nothing. So if you see something varying at a quarter of an hour time, it means that the object is smaller than a quarter of an hour light time. So this is very interesting because in general we don't resolve the object and with the variability we can resolve it. I want to uh, just mention this uh, very interesting feature that uh, has been discovered around the Sagittarius R in 2018, uh, 11, sorry. And it is this, uh, uh, we have hoped to have a gas cloud. A gas cloud, why? Because before, all this monitoring was due to stars in the infrared. And this time, there was a line, a bracket gamma line in the infrared. The emission lines is due to the gas. So it was very exciting because a gas cloud is very diffuse in general. And uh, arriving to the black hole, it would be uh, tidally distorted and will fall on the black hole and will have an activity, a fireworks, in fact. Because uh, our nucleus is not active. It could have been active because of that. So what you see here in 2008, you see in the diagram velocity position that the Keplerian orbit has this way. So this is going to the Keplerian orbit. In 2011, it was near the uh, pericenter. So there was hope. And of course, all the telescopes looked in 2013 because the prediction were that in 2013, it will 
path to the to the Paris Center and it will be disrupted. The simulations were there, so you see the clouds is completely disrupted by the tidal forces and fall on Sagittarius A, so uh, it will at last uh, have a, a banquet here and then it can have some activity. And what happened after all these uh, telescopes pointed, well, we pointed in 2013 and then thinking that this was wrong, it was the same in 2014. And afterwards, but nothing happened. It was a real disappointment. <laughs> Nothing happened. In 2015, the gas cloud was going out, out and then nothing, it was not disrupted. So the conclusion was it was not a simple gas cloud, maybe it was an envelope of gas around a star and the star was dense enough to keep the coherence of the gas cloud and it was not tightly disrupted and so on. So maybe some time, well, disappeared. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> Uh, so finally, uh, it's, it follows the Kepler orbit, and we are waiting that another cloud will fall someday. <laughs> what can come, in fact, to the uh, center of our galaxy? Maybe the next violent event, the next is uh, two billion years <laughs> from now, <laughs> the next one, is maybe the collision with our uh, neighbor Andromeda, that you can recognize Andromeda here, it's an artist view of the Milky Way colliding with Andromeda. And we know that Andromeda is going towards us with 200 kilometers per second. And at some point, we can predict, uh, even better when you have the velocity proper motion with Gaia, we will have it, uh, at which time Andromeda will fall to this. Andromeda has a much bigger black hole. The black hole here is 30 times more massive than uh, the one in the Milky Way. So we can predict the merger of the two galaxies first. There might be a starburst because the both galaxies have gas. Uh, this is well known. We know a lot of galaxies that have make a starburst and so on. But then also there will be a merger of the two black holes. And this is very interesting because after the merger of these two black holes, you will have a lot of gravitational waves. And as you know, we have been uh, able to detect gravitational waves very recently, so it's very important. I make a parenthesis here to describe uh, this uh, event because it's very important that uh, a new open window has been uh, there here. Uh, gravitational waves is, as you see, a wave of deformation of space that is propagating the signal that the uh, gravity force are varying. When you have two black holes uh, rotating the one around the other, the gravity field is changing every time. It's not stable, so you have to propagate this information. And this is done here. And the first gravitational wave has been discovered in September 2015 and been published in 2016, so last year. And I just come back to this uh, event, how can they do that? It's really uh, impressive. I am still impressed uh, by this, in fact, one year after, that uh, they measure a very, 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 very tiny uh, difference of length between two uh, lever arms, in fact, because when there is a gravitational wave working, the, the space is deformed and the distance between these two points, even if they are not moving, they will uh, move, but very tiny. So what they do, is that they, they put a laser here, they reflect partially the laser in this separatrix here, going to a mirror, and then this part is going there, and they interfere at the end. If the two arms are equal in, long, in length, you have a black fringe here, but if there is a perturbation in one side, then you will have fringes here, and this has been really detected, and this is the principle which is very clear to see. The length are varying, of course, exaggerated. And you see the fringes that you measure. And you can have optical. So there is uh, several interferometers. LIGO, LIGO is uh, American, the one in the Washington in the, in the West, and one in Louisiana. And now the Virgo is operating since a few months. And there is rumor that there will be another event very soon published. Here. When you look in the technique, it's very, very, very difficult. And uh, it's not as simple as the very schematic thing I've shown. Here you, you see the gravitational wave, which is a, a quadrupole, in fact. It's not a dipole, quadrupole. Oops. So it will come back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, the, the problem is that uh, the, when you have two black holes of stellar mass, you expect a frequency of 100 hertz. It's the frequency of rotation, the two black holes, the one around the other. 
uh, of course it's varying, but around 100. And of course, it's around the, uh, the audio frequencies. But it's not the velocity of sound, it's the velocity of light. So the wavelength is 3,000 kilometers. So of course, we, the, the lever arm of LIGO is 4 kilometers. So how can they detect? In fact, they are making a laser cavity, and they have a cavity reflecting 1,000 times, so they can have 4,000 kilometers of arm. That's why they can do that. And uh, here also, and you see these uh, mirrors, they are perfect mirrors, of course, after a thousand reflections, they must have the signal. So it's really uh, a performance. Uh, the mirrors have not to be uh, sensitive to all vibrations, the trucks, the metro, the tram, and so on. So they are in uh, equilibrium in one dimension. And, um, well, the, the length they measure is 10 to minus 18 meter. It's really amazing. The proton size is then minus 15, so it's much lower than the proton size. And in relative, with 4 kilometers, it's 10 to minus 21. So how is it possible? <laughs> they succeeded. <laughs> they succeeded and they saw this signal, which is very beautiful, in fact. Uh, the model is here and the observation is there. It's really uh, almost the model. You see, as a function of time, how much is the duration. You see here the scale is 0.1 second. All this merger of uh, black holes is 0.1 second. And of course, you see uh, they are rotating slowly and then, okay, so the frequency is climbing. And you have this slow and then, so if you have the frequency as a function of time, you have this little bird that is. So you see the frequency is coming up. And also what means that uh, all people are convinced that, that they see the same signal in Washington and in Louisiana. Here is uh, Hanford and Livingston. And with the right delay, because when you look, well, first, that there is also for all the other events, you have a library of models that people, theoreticians, have uh, worked out. You have three steps in the merger of the black holes. You have first the spiraling uh, phase, and in this phase, they can make some uh, approximation, post-Newtonian approximation here, and they have a lot of computation, but it is feasible. And then in the merger zone, they cannot make, there is no equations, so they have a, a numerical relativity. And then at the end, the relaxation thing, the ring down phase, they make the approximation of black hole with certain perturbation. All this is controlled and they have thousands of examples in the library. So what they do when they, they observe some noise in the gravitational uh, detector, they compare with the library of events and then they deduce if this uh, true event of gravitational wave and what are the masses involved. Okay, and the, the masses is here, you have this uh, frequency linked to the masses and so on. So, for this event, as you see, uh, there was, well, first, there is 10 milliseconds for the light to go to uh, Washington to Louisiana, and they, they saw the same signal with this delay, so it was another confirmation. And also the masses, this was a surprise, in fact, well, we were expecting to find this, uh, this uh, signal, but the masses are enormous, 29 and 36. So the mass of black hole were merging, so the total of the binary is 65. After the merger, it is 62. So three solar masses have disappeared. And where? Well, in fact, it's the energy necessary to send the gravitational wave. It's really a, a strong energy because uh, the event was very, very far away. It was 1.3 billion light years away. So you have to deform space during 1.3 billion uh, years. And this is a lot of energy, and three suns have to be sacrificed in this. <laughs> so you see uh, now that this, why it was a surprise? It's because you have a, a number of masses in function of time, if you know. We, before this LIGO event, sorry, but it will come back, we had uh, this uh, mass of black holes that I talked about uh, recently. That is, it's more frequent. <laughs> but uh, here, that was 10, 15 solar mass black holes that were discovered by the X-ray binaries. But here you see 
how more massive they were than the one that were discovered previously. So this was a really a surprise, although some papers have predicted that, but not the majority, in fact. And here are the events that were from LIGO, all uh, mergers of two black holes, and uh, people have been alerted by optical telescopes, and there was no electromagnetic counterpart. There is no uh, event in optical and so on. And there is a rumor that will be soon uh, known, maybe, that uh, uh, there is a merger involving a neutron star, maybe two neutron stars and a neutron star black hole, that will be discovered. And there, there could be an, uh, some electromagnetic uh, event, because a neutron star has something around the horizon. So it is, and this uh, involved the Virgo, which is the uh, European. Uh, just disconnect quickly. And yes, maybe something. So now I will come back to to the supermassive black hole. It was a parenthesis with, uh, with the gravitational wave, and the supermassive black holes give rise to uh, the most uh, bright object in the universe. In fact, the black holes, paradoxically. Uh, they are black, they don't radiate anything, but uh, they give rise to the most, uh, the brightest object, which are the quasars. The quasars, they have been discovered in uh, 1963 by uh, Martin Schmidt. It makes the cover of the Time magazine, so it was a strong event. Anyway, <laughs> and um, why uh, it was discovered, this, uh, in fact, we knew uh, radio sources. Uh, 3C is the third catalog of Cambridge, so it was known for a long time. There was a radio source, some jets, and but the optical counterpart is a star. This is one. So uh, people uh, call that quasi-star. But uh, the spectrum of the star was very strange and didn't look like a star. And the genius idea of uh, uh, Martin Schmidt was to see that the spectrum can be interpreted if you redshift the lines, and then you retrieve the, the hydrogen lines or other lines, yeah. So the idea is was that uh, the, this quasar was at very long distance because uh, it is redshifted by the expansion of the universe and it is very, uh, very remote object. At the epoch, it was uh, this redshift, which is now a low redshift, but at the epoch, it was high redshift. And um, this is then very, very bright, uh, intrinsically, and uh, progressively, they learn that there is a galaxy behind. Here you see uh, with the HST image that you can subtract, because you are in space, you are not blurred by the atmosphere, you can subtract the point source. And when you subtract the point source, you see a galaxy behind. And the, the point that why you have not seen the galaxy before, it's because the quasar, the nucleus, the black hole, is radiating thousand times more than the galaxy. So you are completely dazzled by the quasar, and you don't see the galaxy. When you, s you are able to subtract, of course, there are some artifacts at the center, but you see the galaxy, and uh, all the quasars are uh, black holes in the center of galaxies. And now you see, uh, maybe you see previously, these small things is not the uh, default of the, of the picture. It is true, it is real, and it is exactly the, the matter that we are rejected by the black hole is a jet, uh, it is a radio jet, it's an optical jet, you see it in the HST, you see it in all the wavelengths, and um, I will show the comparison by HST jet, you see in detail, it has a lot of hot spots, a lot of clumps. Uh, Chandra is an X-ray uh, satellite, which is able to see very high energy uh, radiation, and Merlin is an interferometer in the UK, very high, uh, baseline, so you can have a high resolution, and you see that the electrons, because there is a plasma here ejected by the black hole, the electrons are very energetic at the beginning, so they lose all their energy at high uh, X-ray, and then when they have lost their energy, they radiate in radio, which is low energy at the end. So you see the progression here at the same, uh, and what is very interesting in these hotspots that you can monitor it and try to know at which speed is propagating the jet. What is a jet? Uh, what is this story? And this was a surprise. The stunning surprise is when you monitor here. I don't know if you see the line, but the, it is three years, three years of monitoring of this jet. And you see the clumps are departing to each other very quickly. And when you put the, the numbers here, they are superluminal. That is, they are uh, 
uh, traveling at lo much larger than the speed of light, between 1 and 10 C. What is that? Is it tachyons? <laughs> no, the electrons are not tachyons. But it is, well, you can see here in this uh, 3C279, here you have 20 and 80, so 60 light years. And here you have 92, 98. So in six years, you travel 60 light years, so you are at 10C. So why? In fact, uh, because it's contrary to intuition. In fact, when you are at a local A, you have uh, uh, the light is uh, supposed to instantaneously go to here from here because the velocity is very small with respect to the velocity of light. Here, the velocity of the clumps, the hotspots, they are almost the speed of light, not below, of course, but not. So the beta, which is V over C, is almost equal to one. So it's our relativistic jet. And the point here, if I take the point A here and B, the second clamp, the main point is that B is closer to the observer than A. It's only that. So it's very simple. Why? The B is closer, so the light that B emits arrives before. Then A has all this to travel before uh, going to you. So A has a delay. And the delay is the time that the light takes to, to travel x. So if you uh, want the apparent time, of course, we, uh, intuitively we think that the light is instantaneous. So the apparent time is the true time minus the delay, because we neglect the delay. So the delay is x over c, the time that the light put to go to here. And when you, these are only geometrical things. Uh, of course, it works when uh, the, the jet comes towards you. The angle theta is very small. So when you, you, you work out these uh, geometrical things that are very simple, as you see, then the apparent velocity has a term in denominator, which is 1 minus beta. Cosine theta is almost 1. So 1 minus beta, if beta is close to 1, you see that you can have apparent velocity very high. So that's very simple. But it's super velocity, and I know that this epoch, in the 70s, astronomers had a lot of papers, I've looked in the literature, to interpret why it was super and they found that it was very simple. <laughs> so most of them, why most of them? Because uh, there is a, a boost to have the jet towards you. You see better the jets are towards you than in the plane of the sky. In the plane of the sky, there will be no effect. But here, you, see, you have a bias to see the jet are come towards you. So all these um, jets are, in fact, in general, radio jets that are in radio galaxy which are spheroidal. In general, it's elliptical galaxies that have this radio jet. Uh, when you look at the HST, this is an example. In white, you see the elliptical galaxy. Uh, the jet is very, very large. It's several times the diameter of the galaxy. It's intergalactic space. And inside, with HST, you can still see that the elliptical is accreting something and gas. So it is really the gas that is accreting the elliptical galaxy that makes the, the jet. And that's why it is rotating, because uh, we think that elliptical galaxies are merger, the result of merger of two spirals. So when the two black holes are uh, merging together, they have an orbital uh, angular momentum. And then the, the merger, the result of the merger is spinning. So when a black hole is spinning, then you can extract energy from the black hole. And it's very interesting. Uh, you have not only the horizon, when the, uh, I've described the horizon for uh, spin zero, for instance, the event horizon. But then you have the, what we call the ergosphere, which is flattened and equal to the horizon at the top. And then you have a, a flattening here. It's due to the uh, centrifugal force. Okay, So you are flattening here. So when you, you launch a particle in the atmosphere, which is uh, spinning on the other sense of the black hole. So uh, at the end, you will have an ensemble which have a lower angular momentum than before. So you, you have a, a spin of the black hole, which is lower. So you are slowing down the black hole. And it has less kinetic energy. So you, you are pumping the energy, the kinetic energy of the black hole. And uh, the particle is uh, getting out with an energy larger than the initial energy. So we think that this mechanism, which I just sketched into, into words, the Blanford the Snapchat mechanism, that can explain the, uh, the energy of the jet. That's why it goes very fast. And why is it so collimated? In fact, it's certainly due to a magnetic field. Of course, in this uh, 
strongly rotating, have a lot of dynamo effects, a strong magnetic field, and the magnetic field lines are rotating. They are completely uh, uh, spun out, and then it makes a tunnel, and they are really uh, confining the particles in this, and this is collimated in a huge scale. It's uh, really surprising when you look at this kind of uh, radio lobes. Cygnus A is a very well-known radio source. You see here, there is a galaxy here, you make a zoom, you see the galaxy in the optical with the dust lane and so on. So these jets are very far away from the galaxy. They are so thin, it's uh, remarkable. <laughs> they are very collimated, and of course after a while, the electrons lose their energy, and then they are slowed down, and they end in turbulence and shocks in the radio lobes. But it's far from the galaxy. And uh, this one is not completely inclined towards you, but you see this jet is the one that's coming towards you because it's more visible than the other one. So we, we can uh, understand why it is so collimated. And why, uh, what is the uh, duty cycle of this? In fact, a black hole has no food for most of the time. It just eats sometimes. <laughs> it's sometimes, and the, the time of the banquet is only 10 million years, very small. <laughs> In the, with respect to billion, billion of years of the life of the black hole. So when it happens is when gas is falling in, and in general it's mergers of galaxies, two uh, gas-rich mergers are, are falling in, and in general we see that the quasars, the nearby quasars, are mergers of galaxies. You can see loops and so on, and tidal tails. So all the uh, nearby quasars are due to the merger of galaxies that revive the, the black hole which is uh, sleeping, and then put gas in, and you can have an activity. And sometimes you see these kind of things, uh, which is rare because uh, when you have a merger of two nuclei here, at the same scale you have the two nucleus in radio, and you see four jets, in fact. Uh, each galaxy has two jets. Why is it rare? Because uh, the uh, merging time scale is 200 uh, million years, and the time scale to have the jet is 10 million years. So, Either one galaxy has a jet or the other has a jet, but the two simultaneously is very rare. So there's not a lot of objects like this. And also, the jet is a, a, a way, a machine to measure the wind that is uh, flowing around the galaxy. Because here, in, uh, when a galaxy is entering a cluster of galaxies, the cluster of galaxies it has a lot of gas, intergalactic gas, which is very hot, 10 million degrees, and which is radiating in X-ray. And when a galaxy is entering this uh, hot gas, it, uh, with a certain velocity, it's like a wind. It is, uh, the jets are, are swept up like winds. So they are not straight, but they are bent, and they can be bent by completely. So you can measure the wind and the velocity of galaxies by this kind of uh, jet. And now I want to just uh, uh, come back to the source of the energy of the black hole. Uh, it's only gravity. Uh, it's hard to to uh, have orders of magnitude, so I will give some orders of magnitude. So when uh, in accretion disk, the matter is uh, falling in the black hole, you have, let's say, a certain mass test M, with a black hole of mass uh, large M. And uh, when you make the computation of all the uh, energy, potential energy lost by the particle, you can get, in theory, half of the uh, mass energy, uh, MC, MC squared, so Einstein uh, mass energy, uh, that you can gain when the uh, mass is coming to the black hole. So it's a huge energy you can gain. In practice, when you do the, the computation, there are some uh, uh, energy loss because of the geometry, rotation, and so on. But in average, in a total active galactic nuclei, in AGN, uh, we think that uh, uh, we can gain 10% of the energy of mass MC, MC squared. So if you uh, throw some mass M, you gain a lot of energy. And the highest energy that you can gain, uh, in, uh, in stars you have the nuclear reactions that uh, make the fusion of hydrogen and helium, but it's much lower than 1% of mc squared. So it's much bigger than all the energy that you can have to uh, fuse H in H2. So uh, when you know this order of magnitude, you know that uh, it's uh, sufficient to consume tensor mass to have this energy of the quasar thousand times more than all the galaxy, uh, 300 billion uh, stars together. And is there a limit? Yes, there is a limit. And uh, a black hole cannot swallow everything. It has to saturate at some point. And the saturation 
is due to uh, the radiation pressure. If a black hole accretes a lot of mass, there is a lot of radiation. It's the brightest object in the universe, so it's a lot of radiation. And then uh, the radiation pressure compensates the gravity, even if the gravity is strong, compensates, and the gas is ejected. That is uh, what are doing the greedy black holes. <laughs> they reject their food completely once they are saturated. And this occurs when you have this Eddington luminosity for a mass of 10 to the 9, which is the, uh, the mass of the black hole, which is in, Virgo, in the Virgo center, M87. Then you have 3, 10 to the 13 luminosity, solar luminosity. Uh, to give another magnitude for the Milky Way, the, the luminosity of the star is 3, 10 to the 10. So you have indeed 1,000 times the luminosity of a galaxy in the black hole. And to have this luminosity, you just have to swallow 20 solar mass per year, which is very small. <laughs> it's very efficient. <laughs> so how do we measure this mass of the black hole? And this, there is several ways. I will just put uh, one or two. Uh, first, when you are uh, nearby, when the black holes are nearby, you can have enough resolution with the Hubble Space Telescope, mainly, to uh, go inside the uh, sphere of influence of the black hole. That is the, the sphere where the gravity of the black hole is dominating the gravity of the bulge or the, the galaxy. Let's say 10 per sec. And then you put a slit. I don't know if you see the slit here. And you have the velocity measured, uh, red shifted, blue shifted, very high velocity, uh, 500,000 kilometers per second. And then you measure the mass. As, as, uh, as you measure the mass of a binary uh, with the velocity. So most of the mass of the black hole in the nearby universe have been done like that. But there are some others. For instance, the Maser, uh, H2O Masers. Uh, this is a well-known uh, 4258 uh, galaxy where there is um, uh, an accretion disk. And there is a Maser because the accretion disk is edge on. The Maser is exactly a laser but in microwave. And you have an amplification of the line. You see the high intensity line. If they are very strong, you can make a VLBI, that is very long baseline interferometer with several radio telescopes in the world. And then you can have milli or micro arc second resolution. And you can see the orbits, the Kepler orbits and so on, and you have the mass of the black hole. And then you arrive to this relation, which is very uh, interesting relation. Uh, you have here the mass of the black hole that has been measured and the mass of the central bulge. The bulge here is the yellow the spheroid that is uh, uh, drawn here. And the disk of the galaxy is blue, in general forming stars, so it's blue. So uh, what is interesting is that it's not proportional to the mass of the galaxy. It's proportional only to the mass of the spheroid. For instance, a disk without bulge has no black hole. So it's something to, and it's not proportional to the dark matter either. So dark matter has nothing to do. It's only the bulge. Certainly due to the, the bulge is due to the merging of some things. So we want to understand why. And there has been a lot of theories that maybe the black hole is controlling the star formation in the galaxy. There is some moderating feature. And indeed, what I want to show you in the time which is left here, that uh, indeed, uh, the black hole will solve the problem that we have, a big problem that we have now, that uh, all the uh, atoms, I will say baryons here, the atoms, neutrons, and so on, the baryons, are outside galaxies. It's a very uh, mystery. We cannot understand the formation of galaxies if you don't understand why all the baryons are out. And why we know they are out? Because we know that uh, in galaxies, uh, you have this vision, uh, schematically drawn here, that you have baryons in the center and you have a halo of dark matter. The dark matter, we don't see it, but we can measure by the velocity of the stars that are rotating around the, the galaxy here that there is a lot of mass that we don't see and we call it dark matter. And we can know how much there is. And in the universe, we know from uh, the satellite Planck, and I have no time to get into, but we know that uh, there is only 5% of atoms or baryons, and the dark matter is 25. So uh, the ratio between the two is 17 or 20%. So 20% in the whole universe, but in galaxies, less than 4%. So 80% or 90% of the baryons are out of galaxies. So why? 
And even it is true for the Milky Way, there is about 4%, but even less. Here it's a function of mass. You see the ratio of the variance to the halo mass, and it is 4% for the Milky Way, but for the rest, even less for the dwarf galaxies, even less for the more massive. So for the dwarf galaxies, we think that maybe supernovae can eject all the gas, because the potential well is not very high. But for massive galaxies, there is only black holes that can have the energy to push the gas away and to put all the variants outside galaxies. Now, it is a hypothesis. We want to check if indeed black holes are able to do that. And we have some, some um, hints, clues, that it's possible. Here I show you, for instance, uh, uh, massive galaxy clusters. I told you that there is a sphere of hot gas that is seen in X-ray. It's not homogeneous. You can see uh, cavities here. And the cavities are due to the black hole because they are uh, corresponding to the jet. In blue, you have the jet here. And you see that the, uh, the jet of the black hole, which is the center, is exactly in the cavities. So we think that the cavities are digged by the black hole. So you see that the black hole has an influence at much larger than the size of a galaxy. At least we see that in uh, this cluster, in also Perseus cluster, which is very well known. Here is an X-ray, Chandra image of the Perseus cluster. You see the cavities. And uh, there are also ripples when you make a natural mask image. You have the ionized gas, you have the cold gas around the cavities here. So the all is turning around the black hole. And we think that uh, the black hole has a large influence. Here you can see that there's not only one cavities in this particular case. You can see the old cavities here, an intermediate cavity, and the new cavities. So we have the impression that the uh, black hole is pushing some poof, 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 like uh, a smoke, <laughs> the Indian and the smoke. <laughs> so constantly, the AGN is pushing energy, and maybe it's pushing all the variants, and that's uh, the problem. We, ha we see also very fast outflow that we call UFOs, ultra-fast outflows, which are sometimes 10,000 kilometers, 30,000 kilometers, so relativistic. It comes from the accretion disk. We see that in the uh, highly ionized iron line uh, seen in X-ray. We see also molecular flow, and uh, Suzanne has done a lot of work in here. Uh, molecular flows like this, it's a lot of mass that is expelled in these flows. This is one of the prototypes, you see the, the schematic way, but you, you see the wings of the line, in the molecules at 1,000 kilometers per second. So you, you are able, due to the AGN, to uh, bring all the variants out. And sometimes the radio jets also, because sometimes the, the famous 4258 galaxy, the radio jet is in the plane of the galaxy. So it's not only perpendicular, but it can have a large coupling with the galaxy. So finally, I will finish here. In my summary, I think I've shown that uh, the black hole uh, is really uh, accompanying the growth of the galaxy. We know that the bulge mass and the black hole mass are uh, proportional. We don't understand quite this, but we, we think that we, we can uh, uh, demonstrate at some point that uh, there are gas outflows due to the AGN that stop the star formation. So that's why there is a, a moderation between the black hole growth and the, um, the galaxy uh, growth by uh, star formation. So the feedback might be enough, uh, efficient enough to uh, prevent the variants to form stars and to eject all the variants in the intergalactic space. That's why there's not enough variance in galaxies. So thank you very much.